Welcome to the Happily Family Conference. We are your hosts. I'm Cecilia Hilke. And I'm Jason Hilke. And we're delighted today to have Dr. Mary Sheedy Krasinka with us. Mary is a best-selling author and internationally recognized lecturer and parent educator. Born on a third-generation dairy farm in Minnesota, Mary now lives with her husband in Bozeman, Montana. She is the former director of one of Minnesota's largest early childhood family education programs, the founder of the Spirited uh, Child and Kids, Parents and Power Struggles Workshops, and the proud mother of two adults. Welcome, Mary. It's great to have you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be talking with you today. Thanks, Mary. Thanks for joining us here in the conference. I wanted to start by asking you about labels that we give kids, um, because that's something that you mentioned in your book about raising spirited kids, that we often kind of box them in with labels and maybe even a diagnosis. What's your view about labels and how do we shift that? Well, one of the things with labels is not only boxing kids in, but it affects our relationship with them. So if I'm interacting with a child and in my mind, I'm thinking, you stubborn little jerk. Um, what happens with no consciousness on my part is that my arousal level rises because I don't like you if I perceive you in that way. And so what happens is my body and brain automatically go into the fight or flight mode. And, and that um, arousal level is catchy. So if I approach a child, and even if I don't use the negative labels, but I'm thinking them, that child senses my arousal level and will match me. And that is why it is so important that we see, okay, he's committed to his goals. Um, he is tenacious. We need to teach him some problem solving skills so he works with us, but these are assets and we focus on his strengths. If, so if I see that child as, here's a future leader, this kid's going somewhere. I mean, look at that tenacity, look at that commitment to goals. Now I approach him in a, in a way that is saying, I like you, I see your potential, and I'm calm, I'm relaxed, I'm happy to interact with you. And again, the child senses my calm energy and will synchronize with me. So the labels are critical to the vision of who I am, but they also influence our interaction. So it sounds like what I'm hearing you talk about is that the labels, especially if they're negative labels, uh, have us approach the child almost like with an in enemy image. And we also then are limiting ourselves. It becomes this limit to the child and doesn't give them these opportunities for growth and change. Is that, is that accurate? Absolutely. And, you know, I stress when I'm working with parents, it's a beginning, it's not an end, that, you, that we don't just say, well, he's persistent versus he's stubborn. We also, we have to see the strength of that tenacity. And then we teach them the skills of problem solving and, you know, and working with others to be able to use that persistence in a positive way. But you have to have the vision of the possibility first in order to recognize, okay, so now what skills do I help him develop? So it, uh, I think that's interesting because I've, uh, I remember we were interviewing, who else did we interview? We were talking about uh, looking at the positive in particular and uh, identifying the positive in the child and, and really practicing that in, and not just for them, not just so that we see them as being positive, but how we then influence the interaction. Like we come from a positive space, like you're saying, that's like what we bring to the game is a positive self rather than this negative self. So I, I get that, I, I see that, I could practice that more myself, I'm sure. <laughs> Well, and it, it does. It absolutely changes the interaction. We come to them open um, and our body, it changes our body language um, as well as we approach that child. And as a result, we're just, we're more flexible. We give them more opportunities to ask questions um, and keep those lines of communication open rather than shutting them down because this is our enemy. Um, yeah. or someone I don't like. Um, but if I like you, then 
I stay open. I stay calm. And that's huge. Yeah. That makes and sense. And I think I relate to that so much. Um, when we were teaching preschool in the same classroom, I got really good at seeing kids' gifts. And it was often the ones, the kids that were the most challenging that I, I really loved them the most because I had done so much work to see their gifts. Um, at home, it's a little different. It's a little more difficult to sometimes <laughs> see my own kids' gifts. And I think a lot of times it's because I get scared. I look at what they're doing and I'm like, ah! and I project out like, you know, five to 10 years or even six months. And like, I, I go to a dark place. Do you have any tips for kind of quelling the fears besides me just keeping my mouth shut, which is usually a good start? <laughs> well, one of them, and because there is a genetic aspect to our temperament and personality, and so what can often happen is if I'm a persistent person or I'm an intense person, odds are high, so is my child. And if people didn't value my persistence and my passion and intensity, then these are the very traits I got into trouble for. And I don't want that to happen to my child. And so it's very important to recognize that my child is actually very much like me. And here's how I have used these traits in positive ways. And here's the skills I had to learn. Um, and then we surround ourselves with people who love us, love that child, and can remind you of, you know, it is your commitment to goals that got you where you are today. Or it is that passion that's allowed you um, to make this happen. And we need those, that support community to, to remind us of our strengths. Nice. That's, that's great. And I think it's so important to surround ourselves with people that see our, our child in that same way and love them and see their strengths. Do you have any, any um, advice for people? Maybe, maybe their family doesn't really see their strengths or their, maybe even their spouse doesn't see their child's strengths and come from that same perspective. How do you, how do you bridge the gap? So I, I, do it by modeling. So someone will say, oh, that child is so distractible. And I might say, oh, he is incredibly alert, isn't he? And do you know that that perceptiveness and sensitivity is a sign of high intelligence? So in my response to them, I'm not saying, no, you're wrong. That's a mean thing to say. I'm providing them with a different vision. And, and again, then with that vision is, He's incredibly alert um, and he notices every sunbeam and every shadow and every tiny bug um, or airplane in the sky. So how do, what steps do we take then to help him know where we need his attention to be right now? So let's use visual plans. Let's use colors along with words. Um, let's remove extra toys and things that may distract him um, when we need him to be focused on a task. But again, celebrating, oh my gosh, our world is so much richer because of the things he sees and notices and shares with us. Mm. I love that. I love when you said um, that you provide a different vision because I think that describes what we do as parents so often when I'm not in fear, <laughs> when I yes. see the, the good things, uh, the good qualities of my child, that I can provide them a different vision of themselves when they're yes. like sad and frustrated and can't see any solution. Um, I can see something with my adult perspective and wisdom that maybe they can't see. So I really, I really like that. That, um, and that if thing. you're a professional working with families, I have had situations where, you know, a parent has said, this child is wild and so stubborn. And I, you know, I look at them and, and there's the child and they're running around the room or something. And I will say, wow, he is energetic and, oh my gosh, the coordination of that kid. And, um, and again, look at his passion and energy. And I've had the parents burst into tears 
-hmm. because it's the first time anyone has said something positive about their child. And that's the feedback that I get from my book, Raising Your Spirited Child, is people will say, is focusing on those strengths um, has changed our relationship. It is extremely powerful. And it's interesting, I heard in what you were saying about focusing on the strengths, uh, you gave that example of, in, in, rather than saying, oh, he's so distracted, saying, oh, he notices everything, is that then in focusing on that strength of him noticing everything, then the solution, or not solutions, but the strategies and the things that can be put into place leverage the strength. And, and rather than focusing on how to eliminate the, the negative, you know, so if we're, if we're focused on him being distracted, then it's like, okay, how do we keep him from being distracted? And how do we stop the distraction, which is a very different angle than looking at how to leverage those strengths, which most likely will be more successful as well. Is that, is that what you, how you look at those strengths and use them? Absolutely. That when, you know, when we see those strengths, then it's like, okay, what skills need to be developed to, to utilize those um, strengths in a positive way to help that child do the work they are, are meant to do in this world. Um, and, and so it is then we focus on, on the teaching and the skill building rather than punishing, which again will disconnect us and put us in that fight or flight mode. That makes sense. So I'm really tempted because of how this conversation has been unfolded, uh, unfolding to, um, to kind of talk about some examples. Would you be up for giving us um, some, uh, some like real life advice about maybe some specific kids uh, and talk about how you would uh, help kind of once we've re um, once we've like reworked the labels and we see them in a positive light, like what we would actually do from that point forward. Would you be up for that? Absolutely. I do okay. that all the time. That wasn't what I originally planned I'll do that this afternoon with a client. <laughs> Perfect. That wasn't what I originally planned, but let's see if we can come up with some examples of like kids that that maybe we've we've known or worked with in the past and kind of get Mary's advice about how people could work with those types of kids. Sounds good. Okay. You start. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> so what if we have the highly distractible kid? You, you already kind of talked about that, that child that um, uh, maybe she's got some difficulty getting out the door in the morning. She gets up late. She um, doesn't know where her clothes are. Uh, she's really distracted by, you know, any number of things besides eating breakfast and getting dressed and getting out the door, what would you do? I get that question all the time. So we're going to plan for success. Um, so the, there's two key aspects to effective discipline. One is structure. Structure are the things that remain the same. So that's our routine, our schedules, our rules and expectations. And nurture is the more in the moment um, responding to emotions and emotion coaching. You've got to have your structure in place. Structure is a foundation. So the first thing, as you talked about for this child, that she's getting up late, um, we have to know how old she is and how much sleep she needs. And she, if you have to wake a child in the morning, she's not getting enough sleep. So say this is a six-year-old. A six-year-old in general needs 11 to 12 hours of sleep. Um, and so, and we also want to have a morning wake time that um, allows us to get out the door without rushing. So say we need to be out the door by eight. Um, with this child, then we may decide, okay, we need her up the latest is seven. 6.30 would be better. So we back that up and say, okay, she needs, we'll say 11 hours of sleep just to make it easy. So if she's up at 6.30 in the morning, can we get her in bed at 7.30 at night? Um, if we can't, 
then we might have to make it seven because then that means she's in bed by eight. So we've got to figure out how it's going to work in our family. But that's the number one thing. If you have to wake a child, you can predict 100% family or morning issues. Okay, so she comes awake. And first of all, I'm also, if the child's getting up at seven, I'm going to encourage mom and dad um, or you know, parents to be up 30 minutes before the children, because if we're getting up at the same time, we wake up without having had a moment to center ourselves. And again, that arousal is catchy. Um, and our kids are gonna synchronize with us. So I want parents up 30 minutes before to give you time to dress, take a shower, have a cup of coffee, whatever you need to center yourself. So now the child's up at seven and we create with this child a picture planner. We lay it out like a six frame cartoon that she wakes, she toilets, she dresses, she brushes her teeth, she brushes her hair, she does all of these things before she leaves the bedroom area. Because every time you go in and out of a room, upstairs, downstairs, you open yourself to distractibility and a power struggle. Now she comes downstairs, so she is dressed. There's no chasing around. <laughs> um, it's not a surprise when you ask her to dress. And you're going to follow this routine seven days a week with a child like this. So even on the weekend, now we're ready to go out. So she comes down and we have a breakfast menu. Monday, Wednesday, Fridays, we eat the same foods. Tuesday, Thursdays, we eat the same foods. She knows what to expect, no surprises. Um, she comes in, food's ready. We all sit down together for a moment of connection. And when breakfast is over, we clear together. And ideally, we get in the car and go to school. And by now it's light. And so she gets 15 minutes of play on the playground before she goes into school. Nice. That's great. I hear a number of things happening there. One is the structure you talked about. Also visually representing it. Uh, yes. So that they can see it um, more tangible. Um, yes. And predictability. You know, I think that was, you talked about that, like with the food in particular, like they know and, and, and having it written down helps make it predictable as well. But it's like, they're not being these surprises, which de is that because that decreases the chance for distractibility? Well, every surprise triggers the arousal system. And the higher my arousal level, the more on alert I am looking for the enemy. Um, you know, looking for where, you know, my brain is saying, hey, we're, we're on alert, something, we're under threat. And so that's going to increase predictability. So the more we can keep ourselves in this kind of calm zone of, of what I call the green zone of calm energy, then the easier it is for that child to focus and attend. That makes sense. Nice. I, I wanted to shift to another yeah, another question. It, okay, so now this child <laughs> you, got is, a whole, you got a whole inventory of these. I was, <laughs> I was thinking you can go. It's okay. We worked with lots of kids, yeah. so we got lots of we got lots of material. This child um, is very emotional, not distracted, but super emotional. Like if she loses a game, she flips the game board over. Um, if she isn't invited to play, she punches and hits. If you want to go talk to her, she runs away. Um, if she gets upset, she throws her pretzels up in the air and runs out of the room. What do you do with that um, really emotionally dysregulated child? Well, I always have my go-to. The first thing I'm actually going to check is how much sleep is she getting? Mm. Because if she's not getting enough sleep and she's not getting her regular meals, so the structure is not in place, then she is a victim to her intensity. So we have to, to get that in place first. Um, and then uh, two things I would say, one, one thing that happens when you have a child like that is it's upset, it upsets you. It's like, you don't know what to do. It's like, how do I stop this? This isn't okay. Which again, raises our arousal level. So I teach parents to have a plan. So when she starts to get upset, you immediately go to her 
the first the first kind of riff or you know the just the 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 very initial sense that her intensity is rising, she's getting frustrated, is you immediately respond and say to her, I will help you. So in that situation, um, the parent doesn't have to think. Or the reverse side of that is you also teach the child, like, she's playing the game and it's not quite going the way she wants or she's trying to do something and it's not working is also for that child to say, I need help. So we have a go to phrase and that child sees you as somebody coming to help, which is calming instead of stop it which again fuels the arousal system and sends her further into the, um, the, the red zone and, and fight or flight. At that point, depending, and it sounds like for this child to calm, she actually needs space. And so we create calming space for her that she knows she can go, in that calming space and it could be a basket in the corner of the kitchen um, so it doesn't have to be that we are pushing them away um, but just she can go to her calming space and there's stuffed animals there's books um, there's lobbies um, and we'll let her have her space and when she comes out and we teach her, you come out when your body's calm. And you have to teach them a calm body is, you can look at me, you can talk with me, you can, your hands are relaxed, your voice is quiet. And if you're not there yet, we need to go back <laughs> um, and calm. But once she's calm, then we go back and do a redo. And that's where you have the, the teachable moment because in the heat of the moment, the only thing you can do is calm her and keep everybody safe. So the, uh, I, I have a, my, my question's a little bit different in that uh, it's about the other kids, whether it's in the other kids in the family or the other kids, kids in the classroom and how to support them. Um, what do you do when there is um, a child that's, you know, got this, this big energy or has this, this, this difficulty and we spend so much time with them and how do you support the other kids that are affected by it? And how do you support the other kids so that it doesn't affect her? Does that make sense? So that she's not alienated and also so that the other kids have something to relate to and just, or the other kids in the family don't feel like they're being left out. It's kind of complex. I'm wondering if you could talk about that a little bit. So one of the things I always recommend to teachers is that when the children come into the classroom, you are there at the door greeting them and as they come in you do a cue check who's in the green zone of calm energy they're fine they can go put away their coats start playing they don't need me right now um, but who's in the red zone who's coming into this classroom already bubbling over um, and i'm going to recognize that and say I see today, Jason, you know, your bubbles are up, your engine's running fast. And obviously I'm gonna change that language depending on the age of the child. But, you know, let's get your coat off and, and well, and maybe you don't even wanna take your coat off yet. So, but look, over here's the bubbles and here's the stuffed animals and here's where you can go to bring your body back to, to, to the, to calm energy. And I, you know, I'm gonna use different words with the ages of the children, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to make my classroom a safe haven. That when you come here, you are safe. You are emotionally and physically safe and you can come and calm your body and then you can join us. Got and it. again, it's not a punishment, it's recognizing you know, something bad happened at home this morning um, and, and I'm upset. And so I need a chance to, to, to take a break and calm myself. 
Okay. That, and so it's like creating a safe environment for the other kids as well. Like they, yes. they have a space that they feel comfortable in and they also know it's not going to be unpredictable. Um, right. So it's, and everyone can use that space. It's just this particular child needs that space more frequently than others. And, and again, I'm going to teach that child as well as the other children to say, I need help. So if something is starting to feel uncomfortable to them, they can yell, I need help. And a teacher will intervene immediately. I say that with Cecilia often. I need help. <laughs> well, my bubbles are bubbling over. <laughs> I yes. <laughs> and again, you know, it's, it's sometimes, and it, it, obviously it depends on the child, sometimes for children it's if they feel crowded. And so, again, then we're going to structure to define space. And if you're, if you're with, you might use a hula hoop, you might use tape on the floor, you might, like with siblings, I create separate office spaces for siblings <laughs> so um you know as you guys were having fun but now you're not so you each need to go to your office spaces and the office space is filled with things that i like to do that i can do by myself and susan call me that's great so, i like office space that's a great way to frame it it makes it feel like you know all like special it's like it's, it's like more yeah, grown up it's, a, it's very grown up. i like the naming of that yeah. yeah. Well, and if you think about it, is that knowing when and how to take a break is an essential life skill. Yeah. What we do not want to do is to turn taking a break into a punishment or, you know, it's, it's a disconnect. I lock you in a space or I push you into a space kind of thing. It's like, no, I, I, I'm as the adult, I'm going to keep you safe and I'm going to keep the other children safe. But let's go um, to your office, to your calming basket, you know, whatever you want to call it. And this is where you can take a break. And when your body's calm, you can choose to come out. So again, it's not waiting for a timer. It's not waiting for me to tell you. Um, it's you learning what does a calm body feel like. That's great. That's what I was just going to say. I, I think that's such a valuable skill for kids to have that self-awareness and to know when they need the break, when they need to go get help. How do you support the kids in being able to identify that for themselves? So they're not relying on us to, you know, call them when they need to go and take the break or they need to, you know, whatever that they're not relying on us. How, how do you support them in building that skill? The self-awareness. Yeah. The self-awareness skill. So there's two things. Um, one is, again, when I'm working with clients or, or children in a classroom, we make volcanoes with um, vinegar and baking soda. And we talk about the things that upset us. Then we put in vinegar into the glass. And then, you know, when the glass is almost full, then we put in the baking soda and I always tint the vinegar red so it's a volcano lava and it bubbles all over and we talk about you know does our body ever feel like that and so we give them again this visual that the the key in working with kids is don't just say it show it give them that visual so we do that and then we all draw pictures of our volcanoes mm. And next to our volcano, we make pictures of things that soothe and calm us. And then we maybe hang it on a whiteboard. And I have a magnet. And when I come in in the morning, every student or every family member as we enter the home at the end of the day puts their magnet on how close to the top their volcano is <laughs> to bubbling over. Um, and then choosing something that soothes and calms. So that's one tool I would use. The other is simply as I move toward you, I would say, Cecilia, you know, your voice is getting louder. Um, you were having fun, now you're not. Um, I see your hands are, are fisted or your jaw is tight. That tells me that your body is, your engine starting to run high or the volcano is starting to build in you. When you feel like that, that's when it's time to take a break. So you, you can directly teach them by 
describing what you see, what you feel, what you hear, the body language. And so they're like, oh, this is my arousal system going up. Um, and when that, when, because kids don't like to feel out of control. I think that's a really important thing for people to remember is nobody likes to feel out of control. It's frightening. Um, and so if we can teach them to catch it that, and what to do, um, they want to know what to do. Makes sense. I like that. That's great. Cecilia, Gosh. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm going to keep that script. I like that script. I want to ask you about one more child as we're wrapping up because uh, I'm having so much fun. Uh, what do you do with the child? He likes things all the same way. He likes to have um, line up his cars. He likes to eat the same food. And if anything is different out of his routine or his socks or his clothes, then he, he flips. So how do you help that child? Okay. So we're going to see the strength of this child is very organized <laughs> um, and predictable in what he likes. Um, for the most part, we're going to respect that. This is important to him. And, um, you know, if things, and, and often it's funny because um, I was in a home where a child would line up her toys. Um, but her father was a professional photographer. And we talked about, you know, how things line up in a photograph and that it would drive him crazy if things were off in the photograph. It's like, well, no wonder she wants her toys like that, right? So, and, and again, it's kind of seeing, this is a skill that can help us be successful in various fields. The key is, how do we cope with surprises or when it can't be that way? And so, you know, again, we want to have this structure. So the number of times it occurs, you know, that, 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 that it's different is minimal. So I have the energy to practice problem solving skills. So, you know, I would say to that child, oh, that was a surprise because if you name an emotion, now we know what we're dealing with. That was a surprise. That's not what you expected. What are, we're problem solvers. Well, what are three things we could do to, to make this work? And he says, we could do it the way I want to. And I, and I would say, that's one idea. Now give me two more. And he's like, ah, I want it the same way. And I'll say, that's rigid thinking. Now we're problem solvers and we need to think of two more ways. What if we did X or Y? And we start doing some brainstorming. So you teach him, yes, you like order, but you're a problem solver. And that term, I, I use that with families. We're a problem solving family. It immediately empowers and it also brings us together as a team. I like that. I like the uh, idea of using problem solving as a way to, uh, to, to empower it as a group activity rather than it being fix this for me or I'm going to fix it for you. But like we're in this together and we're going to figure this all out together. So I, right. I, I appreciate that, that, that wording. I think the wording is, can be really valuable. Um, it, even when we started even just talking about how we would name labels and how that can be detrimental or it can be powerful. Uh, this is, this is, this conversation, I feel like we could just go on. I feel like we could play stump Mary for a while. <laughs> I don't we, think we'd stump and you. And we'd never be able to. <laughs> I, I really appreciated being able to hear your insights and your strategies in these kids um, that we, we talked about. Um, but as we do wrap up, do you have any final words or uh, like a final ask that you'd like to make of the folks that are here in the conference? I would say focus on strengths always choose to connect and as we're interacting with the kids I, you know to think about am i connecting or disconnecting here um and so it's focus on those strengths choose to connect and i will emphasize put that structure in place the sleep 
the meals, the regular exercise. So then you have the patience, the energy to do the emotion coaching when children get upset because it's occurring three times a day instead of 30. Yeah. So valuable, I think. And what you just said just now was you were talking about structure, not just for the kids, but also for the parents too. Yeah. Yes. Important. I like yeah. that. Yes. I forget that. I can use that. Mary, <laughs> how could other people uh, find out more about you? I mean, this has been a great conversation and I think people probably would like to find out, you know, how can they find out more that you have and more about your book? What's the best way for them to do that online? So they can go to my website, parentchildhelp.com. Dot com and it's books. I have Raising Your Spirited Child, Sleepless in America, Is This Child Misbehaving or Missing Sleep, Kids, Parents, and Power Struggles, and the Raising Your Spirited Child workbook as well. Great. And you mentioned uh, before you started the interview that you also have a Facebook group that has some access in there. Yes. So we have a very large support uh, group for for people living and working with spirited children. And again, if you go to my website at parentchildhelp.com, there is a link to join the uh, Facebook group. And you'll also not only hear from other parents, um, but receive um, a weekly blog post from me as well. Fantastic. We'll include those in the speaker notes. This is such a resource. You're such a wealth of support and, uh, you know, community building for parents that have, you know, some tough, sometimes it can be really tough, I think, for raising spirited kids. And so thank you for what you provide for that. And uh, thank you for how that makes an easier world for all of us. And uh, we look forward to talking to you again in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for being